I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he would kindly help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. He's a kind and compassionate friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver, make of my troubles quickly an end. Tempted and tried, I need a great savior, one who can help my burdens to bear. I must tell Jesus, He's all my cares and sorrows will share. Oh, how the world to evil allures me. Oh, how my heart is tempted to sin. I must tell Jesus, and he will help me to over the world the victory to win. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Doctor Is In on the ICN Impact Network. I am your host, Dr. Rick Sampson, Professor of Biblical Theological Studies, President and Founder of Sanctification Deliverance Ministries, where we talk about health, healing, and wellness from a biblical and medical perspective. If you would like to know more about this ministry and would like to support this program with your donations, go to our website at thehealthminister.org or send it to Sanctification Deliverance Ministries, P.O. Box 1082, Norristown, PA 19404. Our email address is sanctificationministries59 at gmail.com. On this program, you'll hear sermons about the ministry of health, healing, and wellness that's told in the Bible and continuing into the 21st century. Now, most people don't understand how significant the condition of their spirit affects their health-related behaviors. Chronic conditions such as obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and other lifestyle-related illnesses can often be linked to unhealthy relationships with God, yourself, and others. Many people are not able to fulfill their life purpose because their health impedes them. Here on The Doctor's Inn, our initiative will help you connect the dots between the mind, the body, and your spiritual health. Our application of biblical principles and medical information will enable you to experience a more correct and deeper relationship with God and a healthier relationship with yourself and with others. You will become aware of the undeniable connection between stress, relationship issues, physical health, and the benefits of making these healthier choices, healthy choices rather, in these areas. You will gain biblical and medical sound knowledge on medicine, nutrition, stress, depression, dieting, exercise, holistic health, anxiety, and more. So welcome again to The Doctor Is In. And now, here's a note from your doctor. When you're handling, or rather heading to the supermarket to stock up on groceries for the week, your game plan is to get the foods that are not only healthy for you, but happen to taste great and are at a decent price. So, it's no easy feat navigating through the grocery store, especially when there are so many options and plenty of products that claim they're healthy, when in reality, they're actually the unhealthiest healthy foods out there. There are plenty of foods on supermarket shelves that you might think are good for you, but a lot of them, ladies and gentlemen, are just junk foods in disguise, easily earning the title of unhealthiest healthy food. Here we round up some of the biggest culprits, a list 
so you can avoid buying any of the unhealthiest healthy foods next time you go shopping. So here's the first thing on the list, Lean Cuisine. Everybody knows about Lean Cuisines. Well, Lean Cuisines are the frozen meals that are thought to be, well, much better than all the other frozen options you might have grown up eating, right? While this brand does offer some decent dishes to eat, uh, the classic sesame seed chicken isn't one of them. The chicken here is breaded, so that's already a step down, and it comes packing with 15 grams of sugar. It might be hard to believe, but healthy ice creams are some of the biggest offenders in the grocery store. This low-carb peanut butter ice cream from Breyers is proof of that. The fourth ingredient listed in this uh, pint of ice cream is called minoxidil, which is actually been linked to digestive issues that can even uh, cause you uh, the risk of developing Crohn's disease. Plus, there are artificial sweeteners in here as well. So, this frozen treat isn't exactly doing you any favors. Then there's uh, the salad dressing, right, that is labeled as a light version, which you would think be safe, would be a safe choice, right? But not here. Ken's Steakhouse Country French Dressing has sugar listed as the first ingredient on that bottle. And each serving contains 10 grams of added sugar. Again, don't let, don't let the low fat angle trick you, ladies and gentlemen. This organic vanilla yogurt from Stonyfield contains 16 grams of sugar. Now that, that's a whole lot, considering there's a good chance of uh, you going to uh, add some fruit, granola, or other toppings uh, to this yogurt to make it uh, a more filling snack. And that just means the amount of sugar keeps rising. Quaker Protein Instant Oatmeal. Remember that one? Uh, the one that says brand nut, right? By now, it shouldn't have really come as much of a prize uh, to any of you that instant oatmeal isn't considered the healthiest breakfast compared to actually cooking up a bowl. You would think that other uh, Quaker offerings up to uh, uh, this protein enhanced option that would make things right, but that's not the case. This banana nut flavor has 18 grams of sugar, that's 10 grams more than the regular peanut butter banana flavor that doesn't have nearly as much protein. Simply mixed berry juice drink. That's another one. You might have seen that one. A glass of fruit juice might bring on all the nostalgia from your childhood and the all natural message on the label might have you thinking this is a healthy option. But one serving of this juice, this juice here, has 25 grams of sugar with 23 of those grams being added sugar. That's a lot. That's more sugar than you'll get from a Hershey's cookies and cream bar. So there you have it ladies and gentlemen. The doctor's note for this week. So when you go to the supermarket, pay attention to what you're putting into that shopping cart. All right, the word of God tonight is found in Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. Let's read that together. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. The wonders of the human body is seen in the beauty of the construction of the different parts and the way 
they all work together. Listen, each part of the human body is made of millions of specialized cells that work together. Each part works with all the other parts to keep the body in good health. Now, there was a very interesting story in the Bible about a man who understood this, this thing about the importance of good health. He may not have understood the uh, physiological or the physiology rather as we do today, but he understood the important interworkings of all the body parts. At the time of their creation, the book of Genesis, God had told Adam and Eve, the first human beings who were made in his image, what things were good for them to eat. Elohim said to them, I have given you every herb and every tree which has fruit on it. To you it shall be for food. So we see in Genesis 129 that God, or rather that man's diet before he sinned was to eat fruit grains and nuts. This was the food that would keep all of his body parts in good balance and in good nutrition or good health. Now, because the prophet Daniel in his book understood the relationship between um, health of body, health of the mind, health of the spirit, he refused the unhealthy foods from the king of Babylon's table. He chose to live on a simple vegetarian diet. I want you to understand tonight that intelligent decisions are very important when it comes to what you eat. To many people, rather, uh, many people eat according to cultural conditioning and habit instead of according to the Bible and medical knowledge. You see, the tongue, the tongue sends a message to your brain saying, when you eat something, I like the taste of this, or I don't like the taste of it. If it likes the taste of it, then it says, I am used to eating it, give me more. Then, the part of the brain, which is supposed to make intelligent decisions, is told, you be quiet, you keep quiet. Powers of judgment or self-control and the rule of the mind are turned off and the appetite desire rules the body. Control of what you eat should come from your brain where you make intelligent decisions. It should come from the brain, not from your tongue. Adam and Eve were evicted from the Garden of Eden. Why? Because they listened to the appetite. They were conquered by Satan because of yielding to appetite. It was on this very same point of appetite that Satan tried to get Jesus to sin. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to, uh, to 11. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command, uh, command rather that these stones be made bread. The Bible said that Jesus refused to listen to Satan's suggestions. His brain and his willpower were under the control of Elohim. Each of the hundreds of millions of cells in the body must get its own food. And I want you to understand tonight that the cells in your body are made of liquid. Their food must also be in liquid form. The work of your digestive system is to change bulky food into tiny pieces and then into liquids so the cells can use them. Now your mouth has been especially designed for this work. So therefore, digestion starts in the mouth where the teeth grind and tear the food into small pieces. Also in the mouth, the food is moistened 
and digestion is started by the use of your saliva. Now, some people boast of how fast they can eat. For example, you've seen those hot dog eating contests every year on TV. Uh, this guy, uh, Joey Chestnut, won his 14th Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest. This man, ladies and gentlemen, ate 76 hot dogs in 10 minutes. But, but he does not understand is that the stomach doesn't have teeth in it. And so it cannot grind and break up the food like the mouth can. Sometimes pieces of food, say a peanut, uh, which if you don't chew it all together, it can go right through the digestive tract and out uh, and without nutrients, it can be absorbed by the body. Fast eating, ladies and gentlemen, also means that the food is not mixed with your saliva well. People that eat real fast, like in these eating contests. Everything doesn't get grounded up in the saliva so you can digest it. So you got whole parts, bulky parts, just swallowing instead of chewing it up, right? So. Digestion does not start properly by the mouth because of this. This makes the work of the stomach of the stomach difficult. Therefore, it is important that you what chew every mouthful of food well. Chew it. That's what God gives us teeth. I want you to understand that your food takes a long and complicated route from your mouth through the digestive tract. The food goes down to the stomach through the esophagus, right? The food does not just drop into the stomach each time you put something in your mouth and swallow it. It gathers in the digestive tract in the form of a ball called bile. Then the valve into the stomach opens and the food goes into the stomach, which is mixed with other digestive juices and acids by the muscles in the stomach. When the stomach has done its work for about two or three hours, the food will have become semi-salad. Then it goes into the small intestines. Here the bile from the liver breaks down fats into small drops. Digestive juices from the pancreas break food down even more, making it ready for the cells to use for nutrition. The starches are changed into sugars. The proteins are changed into amino acids. Your small intestine, ladies and gentlemen, is about 23 foot or feet long. For other creatures, other animals uh, with a smaller uh, intestines of this length, vegetables are much more uh, better for them to eat rather than meat. The food you eat becomes liquid by the time it moves along through the rest of the intestine. The walls of the small intestine are covered by small hair-like projections called villi. Inside each of these is a network of tiny blood vessels. These blood vessels absorb the food that is needed and the blood cells pick it up here and carry it to the rest of your body. The large intestine absorbs most of the water you drink and the body gets rid of the remaining waste in the form of feces. The process of digestion takes three to four hours, ladies and gentlemen. The digestive tract should always have time to rest between meals. That's why you should never, 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 never eat anything between meals, right? If we obey this rule, you will have less stomach trouble and your body will be healthier. Elohim, our God, made every cell in your body to depend upon you what you put into your stomach for its food. Your stomach cannot make good nutritional, nutritioning food out of bad, poor quality food. Like what? Processed food, right? 
Every organ in your body shows the result of what you have put in your stomach. And your brain reflects the way you treat your stomach just like a mirror reflects your face. Now, because Daniel and his three friends understood these principles of the relation between the stomach and the mind, they were careful to eat only those things that were good for the nourishment of the body. At the end of their 10 day training period, they were better looking, stronger, healthier, and 10 times wiser than the Babylonian students who ate according to taste and customs. Because Daniel's mind was clear due to his habits of proper eating, God was able to use Daniel throughout his captivity in a foreign country. You see, according to the book of Daniel chapter 2, Daniel lived in Babylon during the time of a king named Nebuchadnezzar. This was about 603 years before Christ was born. One night while the king was sleeping, he had a dream, but when he awoke, he could not remember it. Now, the king had faith, a lot of faith in his astrologers, his magicians, and all the sorcerers that he had in his kingdom. So he called all of these men and asked them to tell him what it was he dreamed. They asked the king to first tell them the dream, and then they would tell the meaning of the dream. But the king insisted that if they were so wise, as they claim to be, they should tell not only the meaning, but the dream itself. The king became very angry with them. And he threatened to kill them all with their families if, if they did not tell the dream. Then all of these wise men made a great confession to the king. They said, there is not a man on the earth that can tell the king's dream. Nobody can tell it except the gods whose dwelling is not with men. In this statement, they confessed that they did not know more than other men and that they had no connection with God. Because of this, Nebuchadnezzar became very angry and gave orders to the captain of his guard to kill all the wise men. Daniel heard of this. He went to the king and asked the king to give him a little time. He promised to tell the dream and its interpretation. Then Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego prayed to Elohim, the one who created the heaven and earth and who knows everything. They asked him to tell them the dream and its meaning. During that night, God, Elohim, gave to Daniel the same dream that the king had seen in his sleep. God also told Daniel the meaning. So in the morning, before Daniel went to see the king, he and his friends got down on their knees and began to thank God, who revealed the king's secret to Daniel. When Daniel, when Daniel stood again before the king, the king said, Daniel, are you able to tell the dream and its interpretation? Daniel replied, the secret which the king had dreamed, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers could not reveal it unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and makes known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. And then Daniel told uh, the king, that it was not revealed to him because he had more wisdom than the other men, but because God wanted to reveal to the king the meaning of things which the king had been thinking about, Daniel said, As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what shall come to pass hereafter? And he, Elohim, that reveal the secrets, make his known unto thee what shall come to pass. So Daniel continues, he says, Thou, O king, sawest and beheld a great image. This image head was of gold, with 
breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, and his feet part iron and clay. Then you saw a stone that was cut out of a mountain without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were made of iron and clay. The brass, the silver, and the gold were broken into pieces together, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smoked the image became a great mountain and filled the earth. Then Daniel began to interpret the dream. First he told him the dream, now he's interpreting the dream. He said, Thou, O king, art a great king of kings. God of heaven has given thee a kingdom, power, strength, glory. You are that head of gold. You see, Nebuchadnezzar had been wondering, ladies and gentlemen, what was going to happen in the world after his death, after he passed on, and now God was showing him. Daniel said, after you shall rise another kingdom inferior to thee. And just like Daniel told him, the kingdom of Babylon was overthrown by the Medes and Persians in 538 B.C. And the Medes and the Persians was a kingdom inferior to Babylon as silver is inferior to gold. But this was not the end of the interpretation. Another third kingdom represented by brass shall bear rule over all the earth. Ladies and gentlemen, this was fulfilled when the armies of Greece overthrew the Persian Empire in 332 BC. The fourth kingdom made of iron, which is the Roman Empire, defeated Greece in 168 BC. They ruled the world until 476 AD during the time that Christ was born. As God had foretold through Daniel, a fifth kingdom did not arise right away, but instead the Roman Empire broken up into ten nations just as iron is strong and clay is weak they cannot stick together. So these ten nations were strong and some were weak and had not been able to stick together although many kings had tried to unite and band together. He said in the days of these kings God told Daniel shall the God of heaven set up his kingdom. It would destroy all those kingdoms represented by gold, silver, brass, iron, and clay. They would be blown away as with a mighty wind and God's kingdom would fill the whole earth and it would never be destroyed nor pass away. This, ladies and gentlemen, this fifth kingdom was the kingdom of God. Now during the past 2500 years this dream God gave to Nebuchadnezzar through his servant Daniel has been fulfilled. Today, we are all in the time of those kings in whose days God is going to restore his kingdom that Adam and Eve lost to Satan in the Garden of Eden. As their children and inheritors of the promise made to Adam and Eve at that time. Now, we may have a place in that kingdom as, or rather if as they did, we accept, if we accept, the sacrificial lamb, Jesus, as our sin bearer, savior, and king. In closing, the prophecy of Daniel chapter 2 is one of the greatest prophecies in all the Bible. It covers 1,500 years from Daniel's time to ours in the 21st century and reveals that the second coming of Christ to this earth is about to take place. This is Dr. Rick Sampson signing off until we meet again next Sunday at 8 p.m. on The Doctor Is In right here on the ICN Impact Network. May you prosper and be in good health.